Mr. President, General Scowcroft, esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to welcome the President of Ukraine, His Excell Excellency Petro Poroshenko, to the Atlantic Council. Welcome, Mr. President, to you and your good delegation, including Ambassador Motsik, our great U.S. Ambassador Jeff Pyatt, who we're very proud of. It's an honor to have a leader with us tonight who has demonstrated profound courage in standing up for his nation's right to determine its own future. This evening, we will hear from the President on the current crisis and honor his leadership a little bit later on with the Atlantic Council's Global Citizen Award. We're delighted to honor you, Mr. President, in the presence of so many of our board members, our regular members, as well as so many ambassadors and other distinguished guests who are here to honor you. But I also want to welcome our audience watching on television or online, especially all of those in Ukraine who have stayed up very late to follow our proceedings. We are honored, President Poroshenko, at you coming to the Atlantic Council at this most perilous point in Ukraine's 23 years as an independent state. Russia and its forces are challenging Ukraine's sovereignty even as we meet. With the tenuous ceasefire now in place, Ukraine's future remains in play. The Atlantic Council Global Citizen Award recognizes global leaders who have made exceptional distinctive contributions to the strengthening of the transatlantic relationship, and there is no leader doing more today to defend the values of the Atlantic community than President Poroshenko. Ukraine is on the front lines of defending the international order that has delivered security and stability since the end of the Cold War. That's why back in February, the Council stood up its Ukraine in Europe initiative. This initiative galvanizes international support for an independent Ukraine and aims to strengthen Ukraine's security, preserve its territorial integrity, and advance democratic, economic, and governance reforms. We've been able to be effective in our work thanks to a talented team and a great group of supporters, many of whom are here with us tonight. And I want to thank all of the Council board members who have stepped forward this spring to ensure that we launch and see to success this most ambitious initiative. I particularly want to thank one of our newest board members, George Chapisky, for the Chapisky Family Foundation support. It is extraordinary. I also want to offer a special word of thanks to the leaders and supporters of the Ukrainian World Congress who are here with us tonight. Earlier today, we launched a new partnership aimed at making our work even more effective. So thank you for your leadership Eugene Choli and Paul Grodd, President and Vice President of the Ukrainian World Congress, respectively. We are grateful for those who have stood behind your charitable trust support for our work. Ian Anatowitz, Marta Witter, Natalie Jeresko, Lena Kazarni, both of Horizon Capital, and Jim Timmerty. Thank you all so very much for your support. President Poroshenko is in Washington not only at a time of great challenge, but also of great opportunity. After all, President Poroshenko was elected in the first round in May, winning a majority in every region across the nation, based on the prospect of a better future, indeed, a future for Ukraine in Europe. Mr. President, it's a great honor and privilege to turn this podium over to you. You are welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. This is a unique feeling. You feel yourself at home. <laughs> and I thank you very much indeed for creating this atmosphere. Dear distinguished audience, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, for me, it's a great pleasure to have this meeting with you today. And I'm honored to have an opportunity to speak before such a distinguished audience. 
First, of course, I would like to thank the Atlantic Council for the hosting these wonderful events and for the honoring me with the Global Citizen Award. A real award winner is, of course, not me, no doubt. It is Ukrainian people. And during this winter, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian participated in the revolution of dignity and to show their resolve to build a democratic European society, free from the corruption, fighting for freedom, fighting for democracy. Those men and women fought for their rights to have a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Many gave their lives to make it happen. And I'd like to dedicate this award to the fallen heroes, patriot, who sacrificed their lives so that Ukraine's future would be among democratic nations. And this is very important. When in the November 21st, historic date, by the way, November 21st, we launched the Orange Revolution in 2004. And Ambassador Hebs remember that. November 21st, exactly that day, it was the date when the government of Hazarov and Yanukovych made a decision to stop the European integration. In November 21st, year 2013, hundreds of student, students and young people, was, they know exactly the address where they should go. Maidan Nezalezhnosti, Square of Independence. And that was the first day when it appeared the first hundreds of people, young people, non-member of any political party, representative of NGO and civil society, demanding that they are, they, not allowed anybody to take back from Ukraine the European perspective. Can you imagine that these hundreds of people, hungry of young boys and girls, strongly believe that everything depends on them and their strong spirit allow to all of us to win this revolution, then later has a name, Revolution of Dignity. Very nice name. And uh, we believe until the November 29, when all of us were in Vilnius, to create the pressure coordinated with the leader of European countries, make them pressure to pushed him to sign up this association agreement. Unfortunately, all the efforts was useless. Yanukovych simply sell our hopes to Russia, to Putin. And I'm proud my country, and I'm proud to be Ukrainian, that we find out a mechanism how to stop this process. And November 29th, and the December the 1st. Can you imagine that in a normal, ordinary European capital, more than one million people was on the street the very next day after they rejected to sign up association agreement. And I said, okay, we have a lots of experience for the massive rally in every European capital. Can you imagine that there were no broken one window glasses? One flower was not broken. It was a, such a high level of self-organizing. Self and even if on the bank of, bank of a street where this administration of the president was situated, the group of this one or 200 provocateur tried to demonstrate the absolutely different character of our revolution of dignity, the people would stop them, stop them to keep the dignity. And the Maidan won, but every revolution, it has to defend their achievement. Therefore, the fight continues. All of you know very well what is going on in my country. 
We faced a blood and aggression from our neighbor, the country that we used to call our friend, the Russian Federation. First, Russia cynically took advantage of the political crisis in Ukraine and, as they called, silently occupied the Crimea. When we don't have a power, when we don't have a government, when we don't have an army, they use this opportunity. Then it flooded the Donetsk and Lugansk region of our country with the terrorists to spread chaos among the peaceful people, Im imitating the civil conflict. Our army is facing an attack from one of the biggest military power in the world. But our brave soldiers are holding back the aggression of the authoritarian regime that is willing to go further and to extend its control as far as we will be able to. What expect in Russian? To spark the fire in the Kharkiv, Odessa, Zaporizhia, Dnipropetrovsk, Kherson, Nikolaev region and have half of Ukraine in the house. And that was the situation when I became a president. It's hardly to understand what kind of danger we have in front of us at the beginning and in the middle of May. But I never ever see Ukraine so pro-Ukrainian as now. I never ever see Ukraine so pro-European as now. I never ever see such a big number of Ukrainian flags on the territory when they pretended to be pro-Russian. South of the Zaporizhia region, Dnipropetrovsk, Kharkiv, Odessa, Nikolaev, Kherson. Who? <laughs> Who made this? Putin. Putin reminds us how to be Ukrainian and how important is our country for us and how important is our soul for us and how important is our language for us, how important is our territory for us. And that's great a fantastic European future for my nation. I'm proud of my nation, and I'm proud of my people. And today, I'm feeling here among the friends. United States is a country that knows firsthand what it's like to fight for the freedom. We learn it just now. Moreover, you know how to win. We need the consolidated support of our partner to confront the attack on our sovereignty and territorial integrity. We need to hear the world speak in one voice against the uncivilized behavior. We must stop the aggressor now. So tomorrow, we won't. he won't stop us. Ladies and gentlemen, Ukraine is under attack because of its decision to follow its own way, to take a stand for its independence. Yes, our enemy is strong and better prepared, but with your support and with our strong spirit, we will win this battle because the truth is on our side. And I have no doubt that the leadership of the free democratic world has created for Ukraine new opportunity. And I know exactly how to win the peace. And I promise you, I win the peace. And I know exactly how to make a reform. Not after the war, but now. That's why I send the anti-corruption law now in the parliament. Unfortunately, without the president, they don't vote you. We come back <laughs> and push the parliament to vote for anti-corruption law. I promise you. On the 26th of October, we have a presidential election. Oh, parliamentary election. This is <laughs> for me now, it's the same. And I think that this is very, very demonstrated. I like the black and white picture. No shadow, no gray. And there is a party of peace. And this is a presidential party and my supporters. And there is a party of war. 
I think, very irresponsible and very dangerous for my country. And I think that we, people of peace, win this battle for Ukraine. We do not allow to make the internal front, because I'm sure we can win only when we would be united. And what is the most important thing now? What is the global world is already demonstrate? Look, in January, nobody can even believe that European Union find out an opportunity to vote unanimously 28 countries in a sanction in support of Ukraine. We do it. We unite Europe. Can you imagine? We <laughs> unite Europe. <laughs> and we do it second, third term. The crucial importance was the leadership of the United States. And we count on you. And we count on the transatlantic solidarity with Ukraine. We are polite enough, not asking the NATO membership perspective now. <laughs> but we keep it in mind, <laughs> I promise you. And, uh, but now we are very responsible and we uh, work for the improving the security, improving the defense of my country, improving providing the energy reform, anti-corruption reform, rule of law. Please, Ukraine need you. We welcome you at Ukraine. Consider and remember Ukraine as a part, have some part of Ukraine in your heart. This is what we need now. Thank you very much indeed. President Poroshenko, thank you so much for those uh, powerful words, heartwarming words, um, and, uh, and also showing um, a calm and incredible composure and humor even in a situation that we realize is uh, where there are existential threats to your country. And we, uh, we are honored at the Atlantic Council that we are able to honor you. Uh, Senator Menendez will be here after our moderated conversa conversation to present you uh, uh, with the Atlantic Council's Global Citizen Award and make some remarks of his own. Uh, we will miss your presence in New York on Sunday, uh, but we'll use footage from tonight's event in Sunday where we will present our Global Citizen Awards. Uh, and the other honorees, President Enrique Peña Nieto of Mexico, former President Shimon Peres of Israel, former Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore, Robert De Niro, uh, and, uh, and an American pianist and composer Llewellyn Sanchez Werner. Um, th this is just wonderful that we can honor you in this way, and you are right, it's an honor to you, and it's an honor to the bravery of the people of Ukraine. Um, I want to, uh, start a conversation here, I'll ask a couple of questions, then turn to the audience. Um, but one of the questions that keeps coming up in all our conversations about Ukraine is the X factor, which is President Putin. Uh, you have had the benefit of spending more time talking to him than I would guess anyone in this room. Um, give us a sense of the man. Uh, What's possible? Uh, you talked about what could be achieved in the joint session of Congress today, um, and which was just a remarkable, remarkable speech and a remarkable moment. Uh, what is possible with him uh, in terms of an arrangement that would protect all the things you want to protect in your country? And give us a sense of, of, of what you think he wants and, 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 and a sense of the man. <laughs> Frankly speaking, I'm not the right person <laughs> to answer this question. I doubt that there are too many persons in the world 
who can explain that. Uh, but frankly speaking, I think the the relationship of Putin to the Ukrainian crisis is very emotional. And because of that, very unpredictable. And that's why we should take very seriously the danger Ukraine has now. And that's why our behavior should be very responsible. And the coordination of our action should be very effective. And that was actually my purpose to the whole of whole of my visit to the United States and Canada. Yesterday I, have, I was in Canada and I really impressed the level of the reception and level of the atmosphere we have yesterday in Ottawa and today in Washington. You feel that Ukraine now start to be a most important problem for, for the Americans and Canadians. Can you imagine that? For those leaders, some of your leaders are, simply don't know where Ukraine are. I'm not meaning the president and any, anybody in the government, but that's what's true. And how big achievement is that the problem in Ukraine, they start to accept and imagine like their own personal problem. And I think that the, what we need now, if you're asking me, uh, Senator, we are waiting for you. <laughs> well, welcome, Senator. Uh, and what is, what is the, what we need now from the whole world, just two things, unity, because only unity can keep the aggressor in isolation and solidarity with Ukraine to demonstrate that we are together, we are strong enough, and we are not trading by the territorial integrity, freedom, and independence. And if we keep unity, and if we keep solidarity, we will have a victory, no doubt. And now, asking what I am expecting from Putin. Three very simple things. Point number one, please withdraw your troops from my territory. Point number two, close the border for supplying your troops, weapons, ammunition, drugs, dirty money, and everything like that. And point number three, please release all my hostages, all my citizens. Everything else we do in myself within a very short period of time. Why? Because we don't have any civil conflict inside Ukraine. That is for sure. Thank you. What, what, what is... <laughs> Coming back to the situation with Putin and the ceasefire, uh, what is your point of leverage with, uh, with President Putin in these negotiations? Obviously, we see what he has, huge military, Incredible country, lots of uh, resources. Um, in 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 some ways, we have quite unequal partners in these in these negotiations situation. What what do you see as your leverage, and then what role does the West play in that? What do you need most from the West? Is it is it is it sanctions? Is it is it uh, you, know, you know armaments? Is it what what, what uh, give us a feeling for this? Sanction can cannot have an immediate effect. This is a long-term action. Another truth that this conflict has not a military solution, neither from Ukrainian side, but also not from the Russian side. And what can keep me optimistic? This is my country. This is my land. This is my soul, soil and soul. This is very high combat spirit of Ukrainian people. Never ever such number of Ukrainian people were going to give their lives for Ukraine. Never as now. And that's make me proud 
of my country. Uh, and 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 your point of leverage it with Putin in this in this negotiation. Actually, we don't have a negotiation with Putin. Yeah. <laughs> I. Do you know what is the best achievement in Minsk during first meeting? We first start negotiation with the. With Putin as a side of the conflict. And that helps us to be closer to the peace. I strongly believe that we will have a peace. I open you a very simple secret. When people of Donbass, Donetsk and Lugansk have uh, people with the weapons on their street, Imagine that these people defending them from the danger of Banderovce and or something like that, some of them believe in that. And that's why they keep this very difficult atmosphere because they, they believe that they will, these people defending them from Banderovce. But when we have a peace, people start to understand what for we, I need these people with the, with the weapons on my street not letting me to send my children to school, not functioning, no electricity, no, heat, no heating, no uh, wastewater, no salary, uh, no jobs, nothing. This is a catastrophe. And why should I keep these people with the weapons who make my life so difficult? And this is the best way to the peace process. This is the best form of the inclusive national dialogue, just to understand what are you doing in Ukraine? This is a criminal. How we should create this condition for the dialogue? This is exactly in the law which passed through the parliament the day before yesterday. Do you know what is the main peculiarities, the main purpose of this law? Not the special status. Special status is, would have the whole, whole of Ukraine after decentralization which would be presented by a new government and by me as a president is a constitutional changes. The most important thing is an election. In democratic country, without the election, we cannot create the site for the negotiation. Unfortunately, they afraid election the most. Because after the election, the people can demonstrate to whom they give their votes. And this is the two, as I told today in the Congress, this is a two different world. Here, civilized, democratic, freedom. Anybody who would be elected, I am open to dialogue with. And the barbarian, barbarian style. When no election, why? Because it's dangerous. Keep only on the weapons and, uh, and create the world which I hate to have in Ukraine. We don't have it, I promise. My, uh, my last question, and then I'll turn to a couple of questions from the audience, and we may have one from Twitter as well, and then to Senator Menendez. Um, uh, security assistance from Ukraine, whether from the US or from Europe. Senator Menendez has introduced a bill backing greater military assistance to Ukraine. Some say that kind of assistance would be escalatory, uh, and others, you of course, have said not. What is your answer to those who say it would be escal escalatory? And, and do you feel that you're closer uh, from this trip to, to uh, military assistance from the United States? First of all, I want to thank Senator Menendez for, the, for this bill. This is extremely important for us, and we urgently need it. And I think that this is the most effective way to, to demonstrate the support of Ukraine. The way and atmosphere I feel today in the Congress, this is unbelievable. I never ever feel such, a, such an atmosphere like today in the U.S. Congress. And I can't even imagine this type of atmosphere, and I think that this is crucial, important for us. Point number two. Look, the, let's not simplify the question. This is not the question that we should receive lethal or non-lethal weapons. This is not the case. I tell you even more. The weapons do not help us to win this war. The weapons will help, uh, help us to prevent next war. And that is 
what we urgently need to build that. <laughs> to build that very patriotic, very strong, very mobile, very professional, very effective Ukrainian army. Because when I become a president, we don't have an army at all. And now, I tell you the truth, some more information. One of the, my Western colleague tell me, we do not help to your army. We rejected that. And that was when I was a president already. Why? Because half of your army is a corruptionist. Half of the army is a FSB agent. You don't have an army at all. And this is very important and difficult test we now have, the demonstrating, yes, Ukraine has an army, very patriotic, very strong. Ukraine has their own heroes, and they are not corruptive, and they are not FSB agent. We have an army, and this is the main reason why we have effective military and technical cooperation with many countries, including U.S. We don't expect you to reveal your private conversations with President Obama on this subject, but would you like to reveal your private conversations with <laughs> President Obama on this subject? <laughs> with President Obama on this subject. Uh, we have a very friendly conversation. And the, I thank to President Obama for demonstrating the leadership of U.S. in uh, protecting the freedom and democracy. And believe me, this is not just a diplomatic answer. This is what we, I really hear today from the President Obama. And I was very happy to hear that. The same word I ha is here today in the Congress. The only thing we need just a unity, Congress and President. <laughs> I'm going to pick up two questions, and uh, that may be all we have time for, but we'll see. Uh, uh, George Chapivsky and Adrian Karnitsky, please. And, and let's take them one after another. And thank you again, George, for your help of the Atlantic Council on this initiative. Um, Mr. President, uh, thank you very much for those words. They were very moving. And uh, I think everybody here was moved by the fact that you were not delivering your speech. You were speaking from the heart. And it showed in your words and in your expression and in your feelings. And you shared that with everybody. So thank you. Um, the Atlantic Council has been a leading non-government agency in um, providing analysis of the situation in Ukraine, the crisis in Ukraine, and in uh, explaining the ramifications of this crisis, of the situation, uh, the ramifications to the entire world, um, and what it means to them today and potentially in the future. This morning, you animated uh, the uh, enthusiastic support of Congress for, uh, for Ukraine, for the leadership of Ukraine, I think that came across very well. You uh, were able to um, obtain, I think, uh, a, level, a higher level of trust and confidence than was extant before. But there's still a lot of work to be done. And I would now like to ask you what you would like to see the Atlantic Council do as a friend of you, as an objective um, analyst of the situation and um, friend of Ukraine. What would you like to see the Atlantic Council be doing to uh, better bring an understanding of the situation uh, to the United States and to the European community. Uh, what could be our most valuable contribution? And Adrian, why don't you uh, ask your question? Here's uh, just very briefly, uh, we are focused on the security issues and on the Russia relationship, but Ukraine's economy has been grievously damaged both by the past several years of raiding and corruption and also by the economic uh, disaster, and I would even say some of the sabotage that has been occurring as a part of the occupation. Uh, are you confident that you will get the kind of levels of assistance, or do you have some, do, or do you really believe that even in a condition of war and 
of an enclave that it would be possible for the Ukrainian economy to revive? I would be absolutely open with you. Under condition of war, Ukrainian economy cannot survive. The same way that like, it would be very difficult to survive Ukrainian states if it would be a war. That's why I'm so <coughs> insisted on the necessity of the peace process. Uh, can we win the war or win the peace? That would be a more accurate phrase, win the peace. And then to make an economic reform? No. Immediately when we finish the war, people will ask us why there is a corruption, why there is such a bad investment climate. Why we have nobody. We can understand why investors don't come to us during the war. But the very next day after the war, we want to see the investor because you create the good investment climate, you create deregulation, you create the anti-corruption, you create the rule of law, you create the independent court system, you create the long list of things. And that is the kind of assistance I expect in answering on your question from the Atlantic Council. That is the most urgent thing we need to help. This what we, we, what, this is what actually we talked to, today with the President Obama. I need assistance of the United States, not only money or weapons. This is not the main thing we, we, we're looking for. We need a very strong and effective cooperation in the reform question. Not only that we make a reform, but the whole world should trust us that these reforms are effective. Sometimes that said that the crisis is a very bad time for providing reform. I'm not believing that. Because now we have a full understanding. The same way, like if we do not bring to the, the peace to the country, the country cannot survive. The same way that if we urgently, right now, do not bring a reform to the country, the country cannot survive. And simply, I simply do not have any option to make a reform or not. This is the question for survival of the country. And me, we Ukrainian, and me as a Ukrainian president, need you to assist the reform of, in Ukraine. That would be extremely important for us. We, we've had dozens of questions from Twitter, so I'm just going to have one from Kiev. Maxim Aristavi from Hromadska TV, um, uh, who we've worked with very well, and greetings to him. What's your backup plan? This will be the final question. What's your backup plan in case of the ceasefire collapsing? Why is the anti-corruption reform not moving ahead? I answer. Because president was not in the country. <laughs> <laughs> when I come back, we, we move anti-corruption reform, I promise you. I'm very disappointed that I should be in the country for, for, for pushing the reform because it should be enough uh, creative potential in the parliament to do this. But because of that, I declare the new parliamentary election to give an opportunity for Ukrainian people to elect new parliament. You know why? Because we live in a new country after the revolution of dignity. And Ukrainian people are different after the revolution of dignity. Sorry for that, Ukrainian president is different. But the parliament is old. And we do our best to have a new country, new people, new president, and new parliament. And we will build a new effective market economy in Ukraine. Back we will plan. be proud. Back up plan for the ceasefire. Well, Look, back up plan for a failed ceasefire. I tell that. If we do not have a ceasefire, if it would, we would have Russian aggression, I know exactly what should I do, and all Ukrainian patriots will do. 
we go to fight against aggressor. And this, that would be a time to decide the, all the Western leaders what they will do in this situation. Because we know exactly what to do. I think, I think that's an appropriate place to close with this conversation. I want to thank you for your wonderful comments at the Joint Session of Congress, at the Atlantic Council, and then in this discussion. Let me, it's now my honor to pass to uh, Senator Menendez uh, and uh, to uh, give some brief remarks and present the um, Global Citizen Award of the Atlantic Council. Well, let me uh, thank the Atlantic Council for the distinct uh, honor of uh, being with you today as, as you honor uh, President Poroshenko and to present him with the Atlantic Council's Global Citizen Award. Uh, he has come here at a pivotal time in his nation's history and a pivotal time in world affairs in the face of Russian aggression. And he came to power at a time when the world order was dramatically changing. And from the beginning, he has been one of the most powerful voices in support of democratic reforms and freedom for his people and the hope for a future free of Russian aggression and expansionism. He was a leader of the 2004 Orange Revolution, served as foreign minister, and of course won the presidency in his own right. Uh, President Obama said it was a wise selection. And having come to know uh, the president, a wise selection it was. He is a pragmatic politician, a skilled diplomat. Uh, the world watched as he led thousands who stood in the Maidan day after day, night after night, month after month. Thousands took to the streets of Kiev, rallying to what he told them over and over again was a fight for Ukrainian freedom and democracy. And now he's shown the world that he's willing to do exactly that, fight for freedom, fight for democracy for his people. Mr. President, I must tell you, we saw today in Congress, I have uh, had the privilege over 22 years uh, to be at many joint sessions, and some of them have been rather significant. But I must tell you that you accomplish a uniquely single uh, effort in proselytizing uh, members of the United States Congress. Your words were very powerful. Uh, when you said, uh, brave men and women who are at the forefront of the global fight for democracy, and then when you said there are moments in history when freedom is more than just a political concept, at those moments freedom becomes the ultimate choice which defines you, who you are as a person and as a nation. And you talked about the unity and solidarity of the Ukrainian people with the United States and with the United States with your people. We stand with your sacrifice, your dedication, and your resolve to look westward and to live in freedom. Indeed, Mr. President, freedom does define who you are as a person and as a nation. You asked for not only solidarity, but a series of assistance. I want you to know that today, the United States Senate Foreign Relations Committee, in a unanimous vote of 18 to 0, voted for the Ukrainian Freedom Support Act of 2014. And it is our hope. Now, I'm sure you are well briefed that we don't always get unanimous votes uh, in the United States Senate, or for that fact, in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, although we have had a long period of bipartisan votes coming out of the committee. There was unanimity of, if anything, there were only amendments to try to further strengthen the support, uh, not to weaken it. And I think that's an extraordinary statement. Uh, I think it is a ultimate sense of commitment. So Mr. President, we honor your leadership, I know you have to get going, your leadership to moving Ukraine towards peace, security, and prosperity. We honor the people of Ukraine who are engaged in this fight against tyranny and for a democratic future as a European nation at peace with all of its neighbors. And I personally view your struggle in the, one of the contexts in which you raise it today. If the United States and the West 
do not respond to the upending of the international order that Russia created here with its annexation of Crimea and with its invasion. I was there with you while this was going on, and the, I consider, an invasion of your country. Then there are global consequences to the international order, and those who will view how the West acts or does not act in terms of their own intentions. That is nothing, that is something we cannot accept. So on behalf of the Atlantic Council, it gives me great pleasure to present you with the Atlantic Council's Global Citizen Award, an award very well merited. Congratulations. to say that how important this type of a word for the Ukrainian people. I think that uh, this worth us much more than money, weapons, because this is a symbol of our unity. This is a symbol of our solidarity. That would be a symbol of our victory, victory in the struggle for peace. We bring the peace, we change the country, and a significant part of this effort would be your participation. I'm sure about that. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank, thank you all for coming. <laughs>